Hello, I'm Carol Hilty, Superintendent of the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind, CSDB. Welcome, I'm happy that you have decided to watch this program. I hope that you enjoy it. We welcome your feedback. Good afternoon, my name is Matt Simpson. I am the Membership and Outreach Coordinator for the United States Association of Blind Athletes, and I'm also a member of the United States Men's National Goalball Team. Uh, USABA, uh, United States Association of Blind Athletes, is a national uh, 501c3 nonprofit organization, uh, part of the United States Olympic Committee and we are the high performance management organization for the sport of goalball uh, as well as being a uh, pipeline organization for all of the various Paralympic sports uh, for the blind and visually impaired. Uh, there are 11 Paralympic sports for people who are blind and visually impaired and I'm going to get to talking about that a little later. Um, but what I want to talk to you all about today is how you can involve your child or uh, anyone who is blind and visually impaired into sports, fitness, recreation, physical activity, all of the above. Um, when a child who is able-bodied, who is mainstream, is growing up and developing, uh, so much of their growth comes from uh, their experiences on the playground. Uh, on the soccer field, on the baseball field, uh, on the track, in the pool, wherever uh, they compete, wherever they uh, do activity. And all too often I think uh, our kids who are blind and visually impaired or disabled of any sort miss out on a lot of those opportunities. They miss out on the social aspects, they miss out on the uh, development, physical and uh, emotional aspects. Uh, they are often not given the opportunities that the uh, sighted kids are, that their peers are given uh, in PE class, in after school sports, uh, in any sort of situation. And I, I want to encourage anyone who's watching, whether a parent, a teacher, uh, or someone who's visually impaired, uh, to be active, to be fit. Some people might want to compete. They might want to aspire to elite level competition. They might aspire to the Paralympic Games. Uh, that someone else might aspire to um, be a part of their high school track team. Uh, someone else might aspire to be fit, uh, to be healthy, and all of those are great goals. Uh, but they're all going to be impossible to achieve without getting up getting off the couch, getting out from behind the computer, going out into the world and being confident in yourself to, uh, to do those activities. Uh, so I was born with a visual impairment, a uh, genetic condition called Leber's congenital amaurosis. Um, so I had a little bit of vision growing up, but from an early age, uh, when I was three years old, my parents discovered I was visually impaired and uh, you know it wasn't a matter of when I was going to be uh, lose more vision it was you know how much vision am I going to lose and when is it going to happen by so uh, growing up I knew that I wasn't going to be able to go play football uh, play baseball play play basketball um, but I loved to to compete I loved to have teammates I loved to train um, and it was a big part of my family life. Uh, my sister played soccer through her whole, her whole time growing up. She went on to play Division I soccer, and she was fiercely competitive, and uh, as a result, I was fiercely competitive, and I wanted to do the same thing. And so my parents said, okay, uh, we'll figure out how to make that happen. So I went and I ran track, and I went and I swam uh, on a swim team. And I went 
liked and tried to play soccer and tried to play, uh, you know, t-ball and <laughs> pretty quickly realized that wasn't going to be great for me uh, because I think to get the effect of competition and get the, the benefit of competition, you have to compete on an equal playing field. So uh, I continued to do all that growing up. And when I was around 11 years old, I uh, discovered the sport of goalball at USABA uh, sports camp for kids who are uh, blind and visually impaired. And I immediately fell in love with the sport and I knew from that day on that I wanted to be not only a good goalball player, but I wanted to be one of the best goalball players and one of the best in the world. And I uh, immediately aspired to be a Paralympic athlete. Uh, and so for the last 12 or 13 years, I've, I've been working towards that goal and playing in tournaments all over the country and training every day. Uh, and so for me, that's what sports has done. It's given me an opportunity to compete uh, to have teammates, to gain all of those skills that my sighted peers get on the football field, on the basketball field, on the baseball field. And I continued to do other sports growing up too. I continued to uh, run. I did triathlons. I did rowing in college. I wrestled in high school. Um, I continued to, to explore different experiences and push myself and find out what I was capable of. Uh, but always coming back to goalball, knowing that that was what I loved to do. And so for any, any child, I think that's really what it comes down to, is uh, being willing to try new things, being willing to, uh, to fail, and being willing to find something that you love and stick with it. For parents and teachers, I would encourage you to let your kids explore. Um, you know, you always want to emphasize safety, you always want to emphasize uh, being responsible, being uh, within your comfort zone to a certain extent. But growth is going to occur when you let your child who is blind and visually impaired uh, get outside and maybe get a scrape or a scratch uh, and discover that there is more to the world than the computer or uh, their braille books. You know, we let our, our able-bodied, sighted children, uh, we let them explore, we let them get hurt, we let them, uh, you know, find out what the world is like. And unfortunately, I think all too often kids who are blind miss out on that opportunity. And safety is, is hugely important. Safety is uh, crucial, but uh, there's a, a definite balance to be struck, whether you're a teacher, a coach, or uh, a parent you know, finding, finding out that your child who is blind just has just as much capability as your child who is sighted, uh, but they might need a little bit more, uh, a little push in the right direction. So uh, for any child, there's, there are ways to adapt sports to get them involved. Um, you know, some kids might be totally blind, some might be uh, legally blind, but pretty, pretty capable uh, with their eyes. So um, finding out how to get your child involved from an early age and as much as possible is uh, a great way to get them active and get them into those situations where they are going to grow as an athlete and uh, otherwise, you know, character development, social development, motor skills, all of the above. Uh, when you're thinking about how to include a child who's visually impaired, think about a couple, uh, three main points in a sport. You think about the rules, you think about the boundaries, and you think about the targets. Uh, so for an easy example, we can talk about basketball. Uh, anyone can play basketball. Uh, your totally blind kid's probably not going to go try out for the varsity team, but they can have just as much fun in the backyard as any other kid. Uh, so the target is the ball, and the target is the goal, the rim, the backboard. So how can you make that more accessible? Uh, for someone who has a lot of vision, you might put tape on the ball to give it some contrast. You might put light tape on a dark ball. You might put dark tape on a light ball. Uh, the rim, the backboard, you can use any sort of uh, 
colorful device, bright objects, bright tape, contrasting tape to make that backboard more visible, uh, more, especially for someone who has contrast issues or, or can pick up on bright colors, make it a better target for them. Then of course the rules. How can you adapt the sport to make it fun for everyone, make it competitive for everyone, uh, you know, integrate as much as possible the disabled uh, athlete into the regular game. Uh, you can you can adapt the rules, the dribbling rules. You can adapt the shot clock rules. You can adapt any any number of rules. Uh, ultimately, trying to figure out what best makes the game enjoyable for everyone. You know, if it's a totally blind kid, you're going to need some noisemaker device. You can get a uh, basketball with bells, a basketball with a beeper, put a beeper on the rim, make the make the other team wear bells, make everyone wear bells. Make them wear swishy, loud pants. Uh, you can find any number of creative ways to to do that. You know, some people might want to throw a football, and I, some people just put a grocery sack on the football, and it makes noise. Uh, you know, you can always find adaptive equipment, or you can make your own. Uh, but I think it's important that you figure out what your kid likes to do and how they can do it. If you're a teacher and it's the PE class, you know how can you adapt uh, the games that they're playing in PE? How can you adapt the uh, tag they're playing on the playground to make it safe, to make it fun, but also to make it inclusive for that child who is visually impaired? Uh, that's, that's the first step. How can you adapt sports? How can you adapt games? Um, you know, we talked about. Uh, I talked a little bit about the Paralympics, and that's the highest level. That's where the best of the best go to compete. And every four years, directly after the Olympic Games, the Paralympic Games occur and uh, thousands of athletes with physical and visual disabilities gather from all over the world uh, to compete for that gold medal, uh, to compete to be the best at their sport. You know, swimming, track and field, tandem cycling, uh, judo, goal ball, rowing, Nordic skiing and alpine skiing, those are all Paralympic sports for people who are blind and visually impaired. And a lot of kids asp will aspire to do that one day. A lot of kids are going to want to compete and, uh, you know, if you can find a way to include them, it's going to start at an early age. Uh, so we can talk about the modifications for those sports. Um, you know, a lot of them are really easy to get kids involved in. With track and field, uh, every high school is going to have a track and field team, and every blind kid could potentially do that, could potentially be on the track team. Uh, and again, it's about finding a balance of safety and effective modifications. Uh, for someone with a more severe visual impairment, they can use a guide runner. Uh, the NCAA and the high school sports associations both approve uh, the use of a guide runner in a race. Uh, Cross-country competitors can also uh, use a guide runner to complete the course. Uh, an athlete with a visual impairment can do the long jump. They can use an auditory collar. They can use, um, you know, description uh, as they approach the the target to jump. They can count their steps. Uh, they can throw a discus, they can throw a shot put, they can throw a javelin, <laughs> they can do all of those events um, with, with any level of modification. Um, typically the Paralympic sports are divided into three levels of visual classification, uh, B1, B2, and B3. Uh, a B3 athlete is someone who is legally blind, uh, but is, can see pretty well. They typically aren't going to use a guide runner. They're typically not going to need help uh, doing the long jump or throwing a shot put. Uh, they can see pretty well. The next classification is B2. Uh, B2 athletes typically have an acuity somewhere below 2600 all the way down to uh, just above light perception. They can see the shape of a hand and recognize that. Uh, and then 
with some field restriction in there and potentially. Uh, and then a B1 athlete is going to be someone who's more or less totally blind. They might have light perception, but they can't recognize the shape of a hand. And those are the athletes. Uh, B1s and B2s are both allowed guide runners. They're both allowed uh, collars at the long jump pit. Um, B1 athletes typically uh, in the Paralympic, at the Paralympic level will have to compete with blackout uh, shades to, so that there's no visual advantage, but uh, they're all competing with guides and all that stuff. So at the high school level, the middle school level, uh, you know, if a kid wants to compete, go with the coach. Tell them it's easy to modify. It's easy to get a guide runner. A teammate, a coach can be their guide. Um, with swimming, it's the same thing. It's easy to jump into the swim team. Uh, if, a, if an athlete has a severe impairment, they can use some modifications in the pool. Um, they can use a, a person with a tap stick at the end of the lane to uh, alert them when the wall is approaching and when the turn is coming. Uh, most tap sticks are going to be a long object with some sort of soft uh, object on the end a mobility cane with a tennis ball, uh, a piece of bamboo with a pool noodle on the end, uh, any of those things that you can use to gently tap the swimmer as they approach on the back of the head or on their back uh, to let them know, hey, the turn's approaching, get ready. Um, you know, as swimming as someone who's totally blind, it's going to be a challenge to swim straight, to learn how to control your body through the water and not run into the guide, uh, the guide ropes, the lane lines. Uh, but it's easily done, and it's an easy way to integrate someone into activity. Wrestling is another great opportunity uh, for inclusion at the high school level. The modifications are pretty simple. If someone's visually impaired and they're at a disadvantage because of the, the, their vision, they can use uh, contact rule. Uh, which is also, again, approved by the NCAA and high school sports. Uh, the blind wrestler will remain in contact with their sighted opponent or their blind opponent throughout the entire match. Uh, they'll start with their hands touching, and if they break apart at any point, the referee will stop the match. Uh, they'll, he'll bring them back to the middle, and they'll start over again with contact. Um, there have been a lot of very successful wrestlers who are blind at the high school level, at the college level, uh, and some who have even approached the, the, the Olympic level, uh, not the Paralympic level, the Olympic level. Uh, that's a sport where the opportunities are endless for someone who's talented and athletic. It's also a sport where uh, it's great for someone to, to be involved and be a part of. Uh, I personally wrestled in high school and I didn't love the sport, but I did it because it was uh, a way to be involved, a way to train way to stay in shape and um, it's a great opportunity to be a part of that team. Judo is a Paralympic sport which has a lot of direct application to wrestling. Uh, wrestling is not a Paralympic sport but Judo is and Judo uh, incorporates most of the same skills as wrestling. It's, uh, it's a martial arts sport that relies heavily on throwing and pinning so it looks a lot like wrestling just with the martial arts flavor. Uh, and again, it's a great sport because someone who's visually impaired can be on a team with sighted people. They can compete with sighted people. They can train with sighted people. And there are uh, judo, judo dojos in pretty much anywhere you go in the country. Uh, you know, within a few minutes of most places, there's going to be a a place to train uh, in the sport of judo. Uh, and it offers a lot of opportunity for competition. There are blind specific competitions uh, at the national level and the regional level and then of course the international level at the Paralympics and World Championships. But some someone who's visually impaired can compete locally uh, against their sighted peers and be at a very you know, very limited disadvantage because of the contact rules. They will be able to compete uh, on as equal a playing field as you can hope for. 
Um, some other Paralympic sports, tandem cycling, uh, involving a, a pilot and the blind stoker. Uh, the pilot's responsible for giving instructions and controlling the bike, obviously, but also for uh, you know telling the the stoker, the blind athlete, when to pedal, how hard to pedal, what they're doing, if they're passing someone, if they're turning, all that stuff. Um, typically, that's not going to be uh, high school sport, but it is a sport that anyone can compete in at any level. Um, you can compete in local road races, a lot of which will have tandem divisions at the, at the national level, uh, at, on the track or on the road. Uh, blind people have uh, the opportunity to compete against their sighted peers and their blind peers, and at the Paralympic Games. Uh, great opportunities. Rowing is another sport. Uh, that <laughs> we don't have too much of in Colorado, but can be a great opportunity in a lot of high schools and a lot of colleges uh, for, for rowing teams. And that's a sport that requires almost no modifications. Uh, it is a challenging sport, physically, mentally, all of the above, uh, and very technical sport. And so for a, someone who's blind and visually impaired to be on the rowing, their mainstream rowing team is going to require a lot of training and a lot of dedication. Uh, but any good sport does require that. Uh, but someone who's blind can compete with their sighted peers. They can also aspire to compete uh, on the international level at the Paralympic Games. Um, that kind of leaves uh, skiing. Skiing is a lot like running. You ski with a guide, whether it's cross-country skiing or alpine downhill skiing. Uh, you're not going to be tethered to the guide. In running, you're going to run with a tether that is going to be typically 18 inches long and you're both going to hold on to that. In skiing, uh, given the speed and the nature of the sport, you're not going to be in physical contact with your guide. It's going to be 100% auditory. Uh, your guide can ski in front of you, they can ski behind you, uh, but the whole time they're giving you instructions. They're giving you directional commands, they're giving you uh, information about the terrain, about the course, about your surroundings, people around you, all of, all of that information is coming from a guide. And that's a great sport for, for people in Colorado. You can go to the mountain and find uh, any mountain is, is going to have access to an adaptive ski program. They're going to have guides who can help you out um, and they're going to have excuse me, the, the knowledge and the experience to to help someone who's blind and visually impaired start skiing and get good at it. Um, as with any sport, safety is hugely important. You want to ski to your ability, ski on a slope, uh, on a run that's uh, doable for you, but there's no ceiling. Uh, blind, blind skiers are extremely talented. They go just as fast and uh, ski just as, as freely uh, as their sighted counterparts and they have the opportunity to compete at the highest levels as well. Uh, finally that leaves goalball and for those of you who aren't familiar with the game it is the only team sport specifically created for the blind and visually impaired. It was created in Austria after World War II as a means of rehabilitating blinded veterans. Uh, obviously in the 1940s after the end of the war there were uh, an, an unusual, unusual amount of uh, young men particularly who were blind and visually impaired and there was a need to keep these young men active, keep them healthy, uh, get them uh, involved in a recreational activity and also the need to teach them how to be blind, how to live with a visual impairment. Uh, you know, spatial awareness, orientation and mobility, communication, uh, you know, tactile abilities. Goalball was created uh, to address all of those needs. Uh, it was played in the first Paralympic Games in 1976 and has been a part of every game since then. Played in nearly 100 countries around the world. Uh, from the recreational beginner level all the way up to the elite level, uh, professional Paralympic athletes. Uh, 
The game is played on a court that's the size of a volleyball court, 60 feet by 30 feet. And you have two teams of three players each, all of whom are blindfolded, uh, positioned at either end of the court. The whole width of the court, the whole 30 foot width, is spanned by a goal that's about four and a half feet tall. And the object is to score in the opponent's goal while keeping the ball out of your own goal. Uh, the goal ball is about the size of a basketball, it weighs th roughly three pounds, and it has bells inside of it. It's a hard, uh, rubberized plastic material that's pretty solid. It gives a little bit, but not too much. It's not very bouncy. And the game consists of two 12-minute halves, during which um, the teams are throwing the ball back and forth, using their bodies to block the ball, and throwing the ball back down the court. The ball has to touch the ground uh, within a certain boundary of the court. It can't be thrown through the air. Or that's a penalty along with a number of other penalties uh, that can occur. Uh, so the, bowl, the throw, goal ball throw, looks a lot like a bowling throw. Uh, and the elite athletes, the Paralympic level competition, the ball's going about 45, 50 miles per hour. But uh, as with every sport, at the bottom there's the recreational level, which is just as fun, just as beneficial. Um, so there's all, there's all levels for adults, for teenagers, for youth, competitors, and for the elite athletes. So it offers a great way to uh, be fit, be active, learn a lot of skills. Um, like I said, the awareness, the body skills, the, the uh, physical motor abilities, those are all hugely important. and developmentally they can be missed out on by someone who's blind or visually impaired. Goalball helps out with all of those things. Uh, I would encourage anyone to check it out on YouTube. Uh, check out our website, usaba.org, uh, for information about teams in your area or the sport in general. Colorado is, uh, has a, a number of programs throughout the state. Uh, Colorado Springs, Boulder, Fort Collins, a couple others. Um, if you're interested, definitely get on our website, give us a call. We're always happy to help connect people with programs that exist or help people start new programs if there isn't one in their area. Um, those are really all the sports. Those, that's a, a really broad overview. And the idea is that you'll get an idea of how you can get your kid involved. Uh, if it's high school, how they can get on their team. If it's a little kid, how they can get out on the playground or how they can play with their peers. Or can they pick up a goal ball for the first time and learn what it's like to throw the ball and block the ball. But um, in general, you know, I think that for a teacher, for a coach, for a parent, uh, the biggest thing is to try to teach your blind kid like you would any other child. Uh, Teach them to throw a ball. Teach them to run. Teach them to swim. Uh, the techniques are going to be a little different. You're going to need to demonstrate a little more. If they don't have any vision, you're going to need to help them. Uh, describe what your motions look like. Describe what their motions look like. Uh, you know, whether you're a kid or you're an adult, if you're visually impaired, a lot of times it's hard to have a frame of reference for uh, what's going on around you and even what you're doing. So give them that, that auditory feedback. Give them that specific instruction that will allow them to understand uh, what's going on and what they're trying to do. Uh, when they start to grow and, and are a little older, start to incorporate them into sports, into games, uh, whatever their visual impairment will allow them to do. Uh, Try to make them do a little more than that. Uh, get them out of their comfort zones. Uh, you know, again, coaching a someone who's blind and visually impaired isn't any different than coaching someone who's not, except for the fact that they can't see. So, be willing to to help them grow. Be willing to push them, and be willing to let them fail and figure it out on their own. Um, it's it's important, I think, for every child to learn on their own and to learn what it's like to, to win, 
what it's like to lose, what it's like to, to train, what it's like to compete, uh, whether that means to train to go walk a mile, to go run a mile, uh, or that means to train to be on their track team and, and compete at uh, a state meet or, or a regional meet. Um, again, I don't think you can stress too much uh, the importance of sports on development uh, and, and general, you know, social skills, all of the above, motor skills, anything. So uh, I hope this has been informative. I appreciate you taking the time to, to check it out, to watch today. Uh, if you ever have any questions, please feel free to give us a call. Uh, again, you can reach our website at usaba.org. There's a lot of information on there. Uh, and my information is on there as well. So parents, teachers, coaches, uh, anyone who has an interest, who has a child, who might have questions, please give us a call. That's what we're here for. Uh, so thank you again. I appreciate your time. Volleyball. 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 Football. 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 What's up? What's up with you? What time is the football game tonight? The football game is tonight at 7. When is the volleyball game? It's tomorrow at 1 o'clock. We have to win. win. Go, Go Bulldogs! Bulldogs. Now, practice with me. Volleyball. 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 Football. 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 Fall. 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 Leaf. 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 The colors of leaves in fall are brown, red, orange, and yellow. Fall is my favorite because I can jump into a pile of leaves. Jump into a pile of leaves. Fall. 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 Leaf. 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 <laughs>